In July 1994, 40,000 people marched on Trafalgar Square. Submission is a crime. You have a duty to resist this bill. This wasn't a demonstration about war, poverty or economy, however. It was about the right to get together and dance. The Jazz Age and its degenerate Charleston in the 20s. White British girls jitterbugging with black soldiers in World War II. Jiving teenagers in the 50s. Young people dancing has a perennial tendency to worry and provoke people in authority. Youngsters are setting up problems in later life. But brain damage or blisters, we can't resist the ecstasy of dancing. Or sometimes just the ecstasy. This is acid, man. Why do we keep on dancing? Because in the index of human happiness, dance is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And never more so than when times are hard. And there was another souvenir brought home by holidaying Brits. Acid House. I remember walking through, opening the door of the Astoria and being hit by this surge of energy which was like unlike anything I'd ever seen before. The wide-eyed stares, the slight lack of control. Eat up white kids who, you know, like kind of with smiley t-shirts and bandanas on. Acid House was the movement that took a whole century and a whole world to create. The ecstasy is reputed to come from the Nobel-winning 19th century German chemist Fritz Haber, who didn't have a clue what he'd invented. The mid-80s electronic dance came from Chicago and Detroit, and then mellowed on the Balearic holiday island of Ibiza. And the clubbers who were to fall in love with this new iridescent idea came from working-class Britain. Unable to wait until next summer for their next hit, they simply brought the Midnight Sunshine Acid House back with them to clubs like Shoom in London and the Hacienda in Manchester. This was the start of British dance's most creative, most lucrative and most controversial moment, Rave. Saturday night in South London, hundreds of young people are gathering for the latest craze, an acid house party in a disused warehouse. Where do you think you're going to? Mystery tour. We don't know. That's why it's a mystery. That's the mystery about it. This is acid, man. People were travelling uh, and driving to old warehouses or old mills. Padlocks would be broken off front doors, sound systems would be put on and word of mouth or flyers would, would advertise the location of a dance event for one night and one night only. Well, when it first started, it was really different. The music was like nothing else, really, that ever had been around. Most of the time, my parents don't really know that I'm going to an illegal warehouse party. I would just say it's a warehouse party, and they don't ask me whether it's illegal or not, because they don't really know about those sort of things. On the early raves, I used to take sandwiches with me, um, which is really stupid. So I'd have like a little little bag with like you know, cheese and pickle sandwiches. So you kind of that turned into glucose tablets and um, chocolate, and um, a milkshake would also be my kind of like a chocolate milkshake was my other kind of fix. But the fix most associated with the rave scene was MDMA, more widely referred to as ecstasy or E. Before being made illegal in Britain and the US, it had been used in the 1970s during relationship counselling. Because the ecstasy was, you know, was a drug which made you far more open and far more receptive. Um, it wasn't a drug that um, made you aggressive or, or made you violent or anything. It, it completely the opposite way, and that's why people were on the dance floor and, and, and some would say felt part of everything, felt connected to everybody on that dance floor. For some people, taking an E um, made the difference them standing at the bar and being boring and to actually like getting out and becoming part of the group. Ecstasy got rid of your inhibitions and suddenly everybody was just out there dancing. Which is why you got some really good dancing and you got some really crap dancing. <laughs> I 
when you see people like you know um, on their ease hugging um, people would kind of be far more tactile as well during the dances um, but nothing was nothing was meant by it it kind of it wasn't like it wasn't a meat market it wasn't where people were going out to pull it was like how many hours have you danced for was kind of like you know the aim of the game and if you weren't there to dance then there wasn't really much point in you being there whilst other drugs had made other scenes the preserve of fierce self-expression Acid House was all about melting, being as one. The DJ was in control. If he got it wrong and let you down, you were all ruined. This was why any DJ who got it right, who saved you all, was so revered. I think what you get with Acid House dance floors is you get almost a, a, a dissolution of the individual. It's not a, necessarily about individuals expressing themselves, but becomes about the communal body the communal kind of throb, the pulse of the rhythm. The ego kind of stopped mattering. You weren't dancing with one other partner, you were dancing with the crowd. It wasn't, to be fair, a gigantic arsenal of dance moves. If you've been up for, say, um, three days and your legs aren't working anymore and you're so tired, you can still sort of do this and feel like you're kind of getting into the track. And depending on how fast the beats are, it's how, how often you're flicking your arms. And when you're flicking your arms and sort of trying, you know, you're picking out the tunes or, or you like that beat, your hand's doing this sort of movement and it kind of automatically you know, starts to look like you're doing a box. So I think a lot of them were just really tripping so off, off their box. So I think they were just like kind of had their, their, own, their own little world where, you know, where it was quite, seemed quite natural that you should do have a dance and then Taylor's putting a screw into a wall. <laughs> All that stuff. <laughs> Inside, wide pupils, day-glow t-shirts, and a family of chemical children playing love games. Outside the warehouse doors, the increasingly hard times of the late 80s recession. Long-established industrial communities were about to take a final fatal blow, while Britain's youth held hands, hugged, and danced the night away. I don't think it's any coincidence at all that after five to ten years of Thatcherism, we see a reaction against consumerism, against individualism, and a desire to reconnect. You know, in retrospect, it's very easy to see that as a way that people formed communities in an otherwise quite alienating world. But as Acid House grew in popularity, it wasn't the sense of togetherness that outraged the tabloids. It was several thousand trespassing youngsters off their heads on ecstasy every weekend. Police moved in around 8 o'clock last night. Instructions to the officers were to arrest the people to prevent a breach of the peace. A serious breach of the peace. A lot of the panic around rave was the idea that it looked like there was no thinking going on. The tabloids said that people were acting like zombies, and I suppose in a funny kind of way they were. I sprained these people because the body heat has risen to such a temperature that it needs to come down again. It's like if you feel this guy here, you just feel his arm. It's like, that's hot. That's about two, three times hotter than it's supposed to be. Do you know what I mean? It's like you've got some serious piece of fever. Watch the jaw, watch the jaw. That's the ecstasy. The idea of mass illegal drug misuse was seen as a problem. Uh, MDMA was illegal, Class A drug, um, and the police on the ground certainly moved against it. I, d I don't think police overreact. I, I think we, we are faced with a situation that, that uh, parents and, and uh, social organisations read this uh, publicity and say, well, what are police doing about it? As is the fate of every youth cult, Acid House was demonised. The government drafted legislation to stop the dance parties. The ravers protested with the biggest and indeed only weapon they had, rave, on the streets of London. Submission is a crime. Submission is a crime. You have a duty to resist this bill. Well, the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994 is probably one of the only pieces of legislation in the Western world that specifically talks about musical structure, it talks about a succession of repetitive beats, and the idea that in certain circumstances, certain people should be uh, prevented from dancing to a particular form of music, I think is almost unique to that piece of legislation. 
But there's no doubt that they really did bring in the heavy legal machinery to crush what they saw as a, as a rebellious youth culture. But the genie was out of the bottle. Rave didn't die. Rave made too much money for the promoters to die. It just became legal. During the 90s, dance led to the modern urban renaissance. The inner city of Nottingham, Sheffield, Leeds, Manchester, Cardiff, Glasgow, Edinburgh in the 1990s was actually regenerated through a particular DJ and dance culture. Uh, those inner cities, particularly that, you know, right at the centre of the cities, they brought people back in, they brought tourists from all over the world to see this dance culture. Hacienda was a great example, a club which was previously a, a yachting warehouse, was turned into one of the most famous nightclubs in the world. Interestingly enough, it's now, uh, like the rest of Manchester, uh, a block of apartments, the Hacienda Apartments. But for all the social analysis and luxury flats, for many, Rave's legacy was personal and permanent. A lot of people were like profoundly changed by the experience of, of, of that period in time. You know, that first flush of Acid House was just an amazing thing to, you know, to, 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 to participate in and experience. It was like being in my family. I really belong. I never get that sense of belonging anywhere else. And uh, you just sort of like memories of um, walking down the embankment at sort of like 6 p.m. on a Sunday night in my kind of like, you know, the clothes I'd gone out in on a Friday night, completely you know, bleary eyed and looking at the tourists, thinking, like, you know, what, what day is this? Where am I? The rave scene defined British dance in the 90s something of which the new Labour Prime Minister, Tony Blair, was very aware. Blair played a dance anthem by Dee Ream on Victory Night in May 1997. The message was clear, things can only get better. It was a carefully spin-doctored statement of intent from new Labour. It was saying we will not outlaw, but embrace and absorb youth culture. In this, Labour was simply adopting the attitude of the public. Late 20th century Britain was embracing more divergent music and dance forms than ever before.